Hello, everybody who's just joined. Uh, I'm about to pass you on to Jonathan, but before I do, uh, it's it's life story biography time. Uh, so, um, Jonathan Hadley, as you can see, uh, a treasured member of the McMillan team. He's uh, been working with us for a while uh, on something that we won't um, that I won't tell you about now. He's working on something very exciting, which we're going to be telling you about in the next few months. Um, but without talking more about that. He's been in ELT for 25 years, more than 25. How many more years than 25 years, Jonathan? Probably 27 now. 27 years. Well, that beats mine. I've, I've been about 11. So uh, you've, you've, you've definitely beaten me there. 27 years. Um, so Jonathan has been an English teacher, a teacher trainer, and a writer. He's got MAs in Arabic and Islamic studies and applied linguistics and a diploma in ELT. Um, he specializes in educational reform programs, working with educational institutions and ministries of education, and renowned publishers like Macmillan English. Um, so I think that's that's about it, Jonathan. Um, everything okay? All ready to go? Ready. Good stuff. All right. See you later, everybody. Have a great talk. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Will. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's always a great privilege working with uh, Macmillan Education. Um, it's uh, morning here. I'm in Wales in the UK. Uh, it's not very sunny today. Uh, delighted to see so many people attending. We're reaching almost 150 people, which is great. Okay, so what am I talking about today? It's uh, global citizenship education, but the important part about today is looking at how we actually do it in practice in the classroom. Uh, some of you may have attended the uh, discussion I did with my colleague Matt Hayes back in February at the Global Teachers Festival. We looked more at the theory there. Uh, I'll do a, a quick recap in case anybody um, is still unfamiliar with global citizenship education, but primarily we want to look at things that are important to us as teachers, i.e. what do we actually do? Before I start, in good ELT fashion, I thought perhaps it would be an opportunity to find out who am I. You've had a couple of facts from Will about me, but I've put on the screen a few more. So just take a while, have a look. Uh, what can you tell about me? If you want to write something in the chat box, some notes, please answer the question, who am I? Yep, thank you, Andrea. Somebody who speaks many languages, some languages anyway, much better than others. So I put English as the big one there. Um, but I guess my second language, uh, probably Arabic or French, but don't test me. Uh, 17 years, right, Japan, uh, not Japan actually. Have a look at all the flags. Aha, fellow Arabic speaker. Yep, I'm definitely into arts and theatre. Yep, 17 years teaching experience, not in the UK, but overseas. So you can probably tell from the flags I've taught in the top flag, the UAE and New Zealand. And uh, the bottom one, perhaps more challenging, it's Yemen. And you'll notice people said, yep, I was born in a place called Malvern in England. That's the Eng flag for England. But I spent a long time in Wales. And in fact, this is where I now live. So from 2019. And that's actually a picture uh, just from above my house. I'm very lucky to live uh, near the beach. So what's the aim of this activity, apart from just finding a little bit about who I am? Um, it's something we can do with our students. And I think it's an important part of global citizenship education is actually discuss, discussing who are we and what's my culture? And perhaps more importantly, what are my cultures? As you can see from my uh, own identity, I have multiple identities. I was born in England, but I now live in Wales. So when people ask me, where are you from? 
I never quite know. I mean, I just have to explain it and say, well, I was born in England, but now I live in Wales, therefore I'm British. But I've also spent 17 years overseas, so I'm very comfortable living overseas, and I speak some languages to some extent. But I also have other cultures that I'm not just nationality cultures, but also I'm a kind of member of the arts culture, the theater culture, the music culture. And I think that's useful for our students to, to look at, that there is more than just a few identities that we all belong to. In fact, we belong to a wide range of identities. There is diversity even within us. And the little diagram on the right is to show an activity you can do with pre-primary or primary. It's a nice one with plates, so different kinds of plates. And on each a plate, like a paper plate, you can ask the student to draw a picture of something that is important for them. And then you can build out the plates in circles, so a small plate and then a bigger, to show that they're at the center of many different identities, nationalities, interests, and cultures. So basically, showing them that we are complex human beings. Okay, so uh, today then, I'm going to do a quick recap about what global citizenship education is, in my opinion, and I stress this is just one interpretation. Then we're going to look at uh, what do we do with this in terms of timetabling it? How do we go about delivering it? And I've got two suggestions. Uh, one is that we kind of model in our own best practice, in our own behavior, and that of the school. So we're kind of teaching concepts behind global citizenship indirectly. And then, of course, we can explicitly focus on particular themes. And we'll look at what that means in terms of knowledge, attitudes, actions, and the skills that you require to be able to know and check and confirm and maybe change your beliefs and then put it into action. And I'll try and leave uh, plenty of time at the end for your questions and comments. As I know, in the webinar in February, uh, people had lots of uh, great ideas and questions. And we may not have had time to answer them. So let's uh, go to the first uh, recap then. I'm just going to do this briefly, as perhaps many of you are familiar with this term. Um, it's been around for a while, but it's become much more um, significant and perhaps prominent uh, since the year 2012. So you can see on the screen, um, the United Nations has been interested in the concept of promoting the whole human and promoting understanding, tolerance, friendship, that would go back to the Declaration of Human Rights, perhaps in 1948. UNESCO then taking this on board to have intercultural understanding, international understanding. Looking at education as not just learning about facts and figures, but also how we can improve behaviors, um, change attitudes, uh, improve relations between people. And this really started uh, getting very practical, as I said, in. 2012 with the Global Education First Initiative. This is where people started talking about global citizens. And 2014, UNESCO um, actually produced a guide then, Global Citizenship Education. So I'd say certainly in the last five, 10 years, uh, it's become a big talking point in the world of education. And I guess during a pandemic, this is particularly important in that there are so many challenges that we're facing and one big challenge of coronavirus, which is a global challenge that we can only respond to successfully if we act together. So it's a way of perhaps um, getting our students to consider what uh, their responsibilities are in the world and how they can help. And this is in terms of not only responsibility, but also opportunities. The, the interconnected world we now live in does offer a lot of opportunities for um, crossing borders, for work, if you have choice. But of, co of course, people are also crossing borders um, through no choice of their own. So to make sense of the world that we're living in, students need to be aware of what's going on uh, beyond their immediate community. In perhaps a national arena or also an international arena, looking at what structures are out there, both to support us, uh, things like the United Nations, um, what cultures are out there, what perhaps the political situation is out there, and also make sure that they have the skills they need for coping in this globalized uh, economy. Question regarding uh, global citizenship, though, is that there isn't one definition of it. There are different interpretations. One interpretation might be that we're just preparing people to know about the world, so global education. 
A second one might be the focus on the economy. Are we going to prepare our students so that they can find jobs in the global economy? Um, is that the aim of what we do, just so that they can find a job, so that they can benefit global organizations? Is it to give them skills that they need in the 21st century that perhaps have greater prominence now than in the past? I'm a bit skeptical about this term, 21st century skills. I know it includes collaboration, communication, creativity, digital literacy. Uh, I think, to be honest, that those existed in the 20th century and probably the 19th, albeit, albeit that the technology was different. So my interpretation and that which uh, I've been collaborating with my colleague Matt Hayes about, is to actually look at the term global citizenship. What do we mean? So by global, of course it means international, but I think beyond that, it's really just looking at beyond yourself, having an awareness beyond you and looking at your community. It can be international, but it can be at a much more local level. And of course, the term citizenship, that's key here. It doesn't say worker. It doesn't just say knowledge uh, knower. It's a citizen. So somebody who has rights and equally they have responsibilities. So my interpretation here of a citizen of the world is that you need to be active in this. Yes, we have the rights, but we also have the responsibility to perhaps help others around us. So social justice for me is key as well. And to be able to do that, we have to be aware of what rights are. I think there are some um, human rights that are probably global, international, but equally, I think it's interesting to know what uh, other people interpret in terms of rights and responsibilities. The UN in 2015 came up with their Sustainable Development Goals, and they saw global citizenship as an important aspect of this. And they define it as a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. So I think this gets to the heart of what I understand it to be, that you have an understanding of what's going on in the world and you have a critical viewpoint on it and that you're going to be responding then to the integrating forces around you. Globalization can be positive, but it can also be negative. So in red, I put at the bottom what I think are the key points of being a global citizen. We need to be listening to our own consciences. We need to be identifying injustices in the world, both in our own community, our own family, on a wider scale. And through this, become motivated to act, to actually make a difference. So we're not only looking at problems and knowing about problems and challenges, but actively trying to solve those problems, whether on a local stage or on a global stage. As I say, it's just one interpretation. And in the spirit of global citizenship, I would ask you to question it as well and comment about it um, and not necessarily accept what I say. That is um, a key part of global citizenship. Within this, of course, we have to have the skills to be able to do um, the task. And these kind of skills or the language that we need to be able to talk about injustice or to consider it, it's going to be different according to the level of your students. So everything we're talking about today has to be dependent on the age group of your students. We're obviously not going to deal with issues at pre-primary that we might at uh, secondary or adult. And that takes into account then the cognitive level of our students as well as their English abilities. Of course, global citizenship doesn't have to be done just in English. And there's a question there about whether some aspects of it might be handled occasionally, some of the time, or in conjunction with the first language. And a lot of this is to do with the teaching environment as well. I appreciate we all come from different cultures, different political environments. So global citizenship is not about imposing one particular viewpoint or particular activities or particular issues on the world, uh, that would actually go against the spirit of global citizenship. It's more about saying, um, what do you as the teacher or you as the students feel are issues in your society that you'd like to know more about and that you'd like to uh, perhaps positively influence or change. So it's very much not about imposing some kind of Western democratic value system. Right, that's the theory and recap. So, on to the practicalities. What do we actually do in our schools? Well, for me, global citizenship education is something that we can do across the whole school. Uh, I think it's something that needs to be shown in 
all aspects of the school, the school environment, in any subject, it's possible to deal with these issues. The key is this word integration, that global citizenship is not seen as a subject that you tackle for 30 minutes once a week or two weeks, or it's one lesson of a book. It's more than that. It's something that can weave its way through all aspects of the school. And in particular, I think it's, it shouldn't be a standalone subject. It should be something that all subjects touch upon and all aspects of the educational institution um, can touch upon as well. A familiar refrain, though, I, I do hear, and it's a little voice in the back of my head as well. I'm an English teacher. Why can't I just teach English? That's my job teach vocabulary, grammar, maybe the four skills, okay, a bit of technology. And it's a legitimate question to ask, you know, why do we now have to have something else? Those of you who've attended other seminars on socio-emotional learning, you know, that's another aspect of education that we're increasingly being asked rightly to incorporate in our teaching. But my answer to this is, okay, we do teach language aspects of, of grammar, uh, uh, language aspects of English, but to do that, particularly as English teachers, we have to have some kind of content. We have to have a written text or an audio text. We've got to have some context from which we draw out the vocabulary, the grammar, the pronunciation. So for me, global citizenship education fits in well into the English curriculum because we have to have content. In the past, the kind of content we have might have been a bit you know, banal or comic or humorous, um, nothing wrong with that. But I think there is uh, an opportunity for us to deal with topics and issues in a reading lesson, in a listening lesson, to write about, to speak about, that perhaps touches on issues that are more uh, stimulating, thought-provoking, that might get the attention of our students and engage them. I'm not saying we should do this all the time, but perhaps just some of the time, some of the content in our textbooks, some of the content in our lessons could deal with issues that are relevant to global challenges. Um, we'll look in a minute what those kind of issues and themes might be. So we're not disregarding the input that we need to give, vocabulary, grammar, structures, and we're not disregarding the kind of output that we need to do with our students. So they need to be able to write essays, uh, emails, uh, give presentations. They need to be able to, to um, speak about topics and debate. All these things are usually within our curriculum. So it's just looking at a slightly different content or context to deliver that. And I'd say that global citizenship education complements all the other aspects of education in the modern era. So the 21st century skills, the concept of encouraging creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and being able to use uh, digital tools successfully and effectively. Well, one way we can deal with global citizenship is just by modeling it and if possible nudging our students so nudging i mean kind of pushing in a gentle way students towards thinking more like a global citizen so what does that involve well it involves kind of trying to demonstrate as best we can in our daily lives in the uh, school environment um aspects of what it is to be a global citizen so that students can see that this is a, a normal expected part of um daily life. So it's kind of modeling it as the teacher, uh, how we behave in the classroom, how we set up the classroom, uh, how we operate with our students in the classroom, and in particular in the school. It's very difficult to be dealing with an issue like recycling and getting students to consider whether they are good at this if we also don't show good recycling in the classroom, in the school itself. If we're going to be talking about the importance of healthy living and the responsibilities we have to look after our own health so that we can benefit all of society, then we need to make sure that the vending machine in our school is not just selling junk food, snack food, unhealthy food. Otherwise, we're going to be charged with the crime, perhaps, of just talking about issues, talking the talk and not walking the walk, not actually practicing what we preach. Of course, many things we can't do perhaps in our own life in our classroom in the school um so we just be honest with students and say well this hasn't happened yet or i'm not doing this and explore with them well why i'm not doing it and can they make a suggestion it's really creating that um, atmosphere of openness 
honesty, and transparency. The world is not a simple world. The challenges that we talk about as a global citizen are not simple. It's not black and white. There's a lot of nuance, and we don't always get it right. And it's part of lifelong learning, taking gradual steps to try and improve ourselves as individuals. I think a key place that we can uh, nudge, push, uh, present a concept of global citizenship is then just the environment in the school and in our classroom. If you look at the pictures, um, can you just try and interpret what these pictures uh, represent? What am I thinking of here in terms of the type of environment we should be setting up in our classroom? If you want to put some ideas in the chat box. Right, so collaboration, yep. We can't be a global citizen on our own. Nice, mutual respect and understanding. Yep, critical thinking, hands up questioning, asking questions, all these kind of things. If we set up this type of classroom where, yes, we reflect, we work together, we listen to other people with respect, then we're demonstrating the key principles of what it is to be a global citizen. And that's getting our students then to, to feel what it's like without necessarily um, putting kind of down their throats what it is to be a global citizen. They're indirectly experiencing it. Likewise, I think it's important to look at the materials we use in the classroom, how we're presenting things. And we place a responsibility here. When we are doing worksheets or we are showing images, are we showing diversity in the world? Are we giving good role models for our students when they're looking at a text about um, the day in the life of a person? Are we using inclusive images here? The books they have in their library, the graded readers we ask them to read, are they reflecting uh, a wider world? The graded readers, for example, are they just giving a very narrow uh, voice of literature? What is often referred to as dead white males, so Charles Dickens or uh, Shakespeare. Or are we giving them an opportunity to read English uh, from African writers, from Indian writers? And many of the publishers nowadays have good graded readers that are much more diverse than just looking at a very narrow Western literature background. There's nothing wrong with looking at Shakespeare and Dickens, but if you only do that, I think you're limiting students' ability to experience uh, the English-speaking community. And in our classrooms, when they're doing listenings or they're watching something on YouTube, are you giving them the chance to listen to other voices, not just the teacher voice? Are they getting the opportunity to hear from a, a wide range without necessarily saying that this is correct? Part of global citizenship is allowing students to be exposed to different voices without, again, imposing that one is correct. So what we're trying to show students is the world is not black and white. It's not simple. There is a gray. And um, when they're looking at an issue, are they looking at uh, all representations of that issue? Here's some examples that Macmillan themselves have produced. Um, I think these are, are, are great examples. So they come from um, Global Stage, the primary course. We've got here. Uh, a picture, for example, of housing. So it's a topic on uh, homes. And they have uh, a nice example of a traditional Mongolian home, as well as a modern building in Mongolia. So that we're not stereotyping Mongolia as everybody living in tents. Uh, some people do for some of the time. So we're giving diversity here, both within a country and making sure that students get a, a bigger, more modern picture of um, different cultures and different peoples. Over on the right, again, from Global Stage, there's a text here about volunteering. And they can see from the pictures, you know, volunteers are all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, um, men and women. So again, it's just presenting diversity within the picture. Uh, the central part is from secondary Macmillan materials. It's looking at teenagers. Often when we deal with teenagers, we just talk about, you know, free time activities, 
playing sports, listening to music, chatting, reading. But these teenagers, they uh, have a campaign to remove plastic bags from their country, Indonesia. So these are campaigning teenagers. And by giving that type of text, we can open up our students' eyes and get them thinking, if these teenagers in Indonesia can do it, perhaps there's something I could do in my community um, to tackle the problem of plastic waste. So let's uh, try a little example here. This is a typical activity, perhaps at primary level, where we do a description of individuals, a day in the life of. The typical thing is to focus on the present simple. So we've got the grammar, we've got some nice vocabulary, and students have to then write some sentences about a nurse and a firefighter. In the chat box then, have a go. Can you give me some sentences beginning with he and she using these phrases about a nurse and about a firefighter? Thank you. She is a warrior, right? That's a nice expression. That's great. She enjoys helping people, nice. He's a hero, great. She enjoys saving lives, right. He saves life and property. I'm not sure he does save life. Ah, oh, perhaps there's something I should have uh, shown you first. You might need to see the bigger picture. Um, would that help? I didn't really trick you, did I? I can see in the uh, chat box you probably worked out where I was going as this. But yeah, the he, the man, he's not that firefighter, so he doesn't enjoy fire fighting fires. He does save lives, it's true, and she doesn't work in a hospital. So all I'm trying to show here is that occasionally it can be useful to uh, show something different. I know in many societies, perhaps the majority of nurses are female, the majority of firefighters are male, but it's not the whole picture. Certainly in the UK, the head of the fire service in London uh, was a woman until recently. So we're just trying to um, get students to realize that not all nurses are female. And that shows you then that the pictures we show, the tasks that we give them, we don't have to draw them into stereotypes. We can show them that uh, there is a, a bigger world out there. What I like in the picture about the firefighter, she's got a nice text saying, my mummy is a firefighter. So um, trying to show people, and students in particular, that most, if not all, jobs are open to them. Okay, so that's kind of nudging students, giving them an environment in which they experience indirectly global citizenship. Um, oh, I just noticed uh, Will's comment. That's great. Will, thank you. If you've got any questions, put them in the chat box. I hope to answer them at the end. Um, I can. I mean, there is a useful question there about imposing Western democratic values. As I said earlier, it's not really about imposing anything, uh, but it is exploring what's what's out there. So, what are these themes that we can explore? I'd like you to get your thinking caps on, please, just for a minute, without putting anything in the chat box. So, nothing in the chat box for the moment. What do you think are key themes that we could deal with in global citizenship education? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. What are the key themes that you might cover in global citizenship education? You don't need to write anything in the chat box at the moment. So what would be some of the issues, themes, topics? What topic would you cover? OK, so uh, I'd like to gather some of these uh, topics and themes. Um, but really, I'm not interested in uh, new teachers at this point particular moment. I'm interested in teachers who have at least seven and a half years teaching. 
if you could please write in the chat box what you think uh, global citizenship topics are, but only if you've taught for seven and a half, so not seven years, seven and a half years or more. Thank you. Okay, I'm fooling around here a little bit in my specification about seven and a half years. If anything, I'm being very discriminatory. And that's not a good look when it comes to global citizenship. So I apologize. I should be interested in ideas from everybody in the chat box. But what I'm just trying to show here is we can also model inappropriate behavior, discriminatory behavior, and then importantly discuss with students why that is discriminatory. So my apologies if you haven't taught for seven and a half years. It's a completely random number. It makes no sense at all. But that's what discrimination often is. It has no scientific value or basis to it. Well, let me share with you what I consider as the key themes. And I've highlighted in red what I just did, which was bias, uh, stereotyping, perhaps, that uh, if you have only taught a few years, you don't have relevant information. That's a stereotype. Um, so these themes, again, I'd say, are only perhaps appropriate for um, some age groups. Um, for some students, depending on their cognitive level, and perhaps in some teaching contexts in some countries. Again, I want to show that you don't have to cover everything. You can cover um, some of these. You can have your own ideas of what global citizenship is as well. But this is a, a list that Matt Hayes and myself uh, came up with. The important part is whatever you come up with, ultimately at the end, it's about exercising personal responsibility as a global citizen. Looking at this idea of discrimination, um, I'm going to show you a, a short video which nicely highlight, highlights one way of dealing with discrimination in the classroom by modeling inappropriate behavior, by actively discriminating with your students. And again, I stress here, the key is once you do it, that you then have a time to reflect on it with the students about how they felt. So hopefully they're standing in the shoes of somebody who's being discriminated against, and they can then appreciate and learn that discrimination is not something we, we wish to, to encourage by any means. Uh, it's, this is actually an experiment that was done a long time ago in 1968 by a great American pioneer called Jane Elliott. This is a clip I've taken from a, a longer program on YouTube. Um, it's called A Divided Class. And in the YouTube clip, uh, they actually bring back the students who were in the experiment. They bring them back about 15 years later. So they're now adults. And they talk to the uh, adults of what it was like to be in this lady's class and do this activity. Did it change their thinking? Did it um, make them appreciate uh, discrimination in their own country? And uh, so you'll see in the clip, there are some older people. Those are actually the students grown up 15 years later. And the discrimination, she only um, allows students with uh, either blue eyes or brown eyes to have a positive experience in her classroom. And she does two days. One day she favors those with blue eyes, and one day she favors those with brown eyes. Again, it's arbitrary discrimination, but that's often what discrimination is. So I'm going to just play you three minutes uh, from this clip. I'm going to turn off my audio now, and hopefully, with technology, the video should play. No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? <laughs> it might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Since I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue-eyed people should be on top the first day. 
I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Oh, yes, they are. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. My dad isn't that stupid. Is your dad brown-eyed? Yeah. One day you came to school and you told us that he kicked you. He did. Do you think a blue-eyed father would kick his son? Yeah. My dad My dad is blue eyed. My dad's blue eyed. He's never kicked me. Greg's dad is blue eyed. He's never kicked him. Rex's dad is blue eyed. He's never kicked him. This is a this is a fact. Blue eyed people are better than brown eyed people. Are you brown eyed or blue eyed? Blue. Why are you shaking your head? <laughs> Are you sure that you're right? What? What makes you so sure that you're right? I don't know. The blue-eyed people get five extra minutes of recess, while the brown-eyed people have to stay in. Mm. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You'll have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground because you are not as good as blue-eyed people. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. On page 127. 127. Is everyone ready? Everyone but Laurie. You ready, Laurie? She's brown eyed. She's a brown eyed. You'll begin to notice today that we spend a great deal of time waiting for brown eyed people. The yardstick's gone. Well, okay. I don't see the yardstick, do you? It's probably over there. Hey, Mrs. Lake, you better keep that on your desk so if the um, brown people, brown eyed people can get out of hand. Oh! You think if the brown-eyed people get out of hand, that would be the thing to use? Who goes first to lunch? Blue the blue-eyed people. No brown-eyed people go back for seconds. Blue-eyed people may go back for seconds. Brown-eyed people do not. Brown eyed. Don't you know? Mm. They're not smart. Is that the My only reason? It might take too much. Oh. Okay, quietly. Okay, it's a it's a very interesting watch, and as I say, it was from 1968. Um, relevance for it, it is possible to, uh, as somebody said, model uh, discrimination and bias in the classroom. Jane Elliott did this over two days. The important thing is on day one, she discriminated against the blue-eyed people, and then on day two, against the brown-eyed people. So everybody got the opportunity um, to experience it. And you might not have caught at the end, but uh, she was looking for a stick, I think, a measuring stick for the, the blackboard. And uh, one of the children said, oh, keep that stick because you might need to use it with the, the brown eyed students. So what they discovered in this experiment was uh, the children started to willingly take on active discriminatory roles in the classroom, even for just a, a short period. Um, it, it's a very interesting uh, video to watch. I recommend you do it. Does it have relevance nowadays? Well, I think it is still something that we can model to an extent in our own classrooms. Again, I'd stress the important thing is to allow plenty of time for reflection. I probably wouldn't do it over one or two days, but I might do it over an exercise, arbit arbitrarily discriminate. Um, in the online world, I might mute some students and say, right, for this exercise, I, I don't want to hear your opinions about it. And then perhaps mute another group for another um, exercise, uh, a bit like I did with you when I said only seven and a half uh, years of experience allows you to, to chat in the chat box. With older students, with adults, uh, you might actually want to watch some of the video. But I, I warn you, because it was set in 1968, uh, some of the language is used about race uh, is 
not acceptable nowadays. So you might have to be a bit careful about which parts of the video that you show, because they do use language that was appropriate in the 1960s, which is no longer appropriate now for race. But it's an interesting idea of putting uh, your students in the shoes of somebody who is not um, who, who is being discriminated against. Okay, uh, I think three things that I would use in um, designing uh, materials for global citizenship are three key words, knowledge, uh, attitudes, and actions. Um, again, Matt Hayes and myself came up with this. What we believe is students need to know about global citizenship issues, and they need to be able to examine their own attitudes and listen to the attitudes of others, and then consider what kind of action uh, they might take. And by action here, it can be just opening up their minds or considering what changes that they might want to make uh, in their own life, in their families, in their communities, or perhaps on a larger global scale. The key thing is that all these three are integrated together and to be able to know about something and talk about your attitude and hear others and then carry out an action, you do need skills as well. Um, and those would be language skills, so communication skills, but also collaboration skills, creativity skills so that you can think and express in an innovative way, and also questioning skills that you're able to use critical thinking, you can evaluate and question yourself and what's going on around you. So the key questions I ask when I'm looking at an issue for the classroom is what do my students need to know about the topic? And importantly, where's this information gonna come from? Is it just gonna come from me or am I gonna try and find uh, other sources so that students can hear other voices? Then I'm going to look at, through this topic, I want them to explore their own attitude and I want them to be exposed to other attitudes, not just me, the teacher, but also their peers in the classroom. And if I'm bringing in reading texts or listening texts, then voices from outside the classroom. And lastly, then the action. At the end of uh, knowing about something and exploring it, to be an active global citizen, really need to look at what opportunities I can give them to take action. That might be uh, just modeled action. It doesn't have to be a real world thing that they do, but it could be. So I could ask them to practice writing an email to uh, an important person like um, or Zuckerberg or uh, the founder of Amazon, you know, perhaps some kind of letter asking them why they're doing certain things. Now that letter might not go anywhere or it could be sent to them. It's up to you and the students. So it doesn't have to be real world action, although I'd argue that that is more effective. And it has to be if the students are motivated to do it themselves. Again, we're not imposing on them. And the whole uh, concept behind this, as I put it at the bottom, is to make the world around them better, fairer, more sustainable. The skills that I mentioned, again, because it's English lessons, of course, I am focusing on the vocabulary, the grammar, the language, and I am focusing on the, the soft skills of uh, you know, creative thinking, critical thinking, collaboration, and ideally using technology as well. So my key point here is to answer that question, why do I have to do this in addition to English? It, it's not in addition, really. It's just a different topic. So I might be replacing something in the textbook or I might be designing a material that still covers the key uh, learning objectives that I have to do, like writing an essay or debating or comparing, contrasting. I'm just doing it through a global citizenship theme. An example I've taken from Macmillan Secondary Sources. I talked about this in February. It's a nice example. The focus is actually on grammar. It's on um, the future tenses, future verb forms. The text, though, happens to be about Greta Thunberg, and it comes into a transport uh, unit, I believe. So the theme is transport. Here's Greta Thunberg traveling by ship rather than flying, and students have to look at the uh, verb forms, decide whether they're correct or incorrect. And then, of course, at the end, once they've done the grammar and the vocabulary and they've looked at transport, we also have the opportunity to discuss the, the meaning of the text, which is whether her traveling by um, boat was a more environmentally friendly way than traveling by air. So I'd like to look at uh, 
three kind of areas because some of you are probably teaching pre-primary, maybe primary or secondary and older. And as I said earlier, a lot of what we do will depend not only on our teaching environment, but on the age of the students and their English language skills and also their cognitive abilities. At pre-primary, we're talking here about building foundations and raising awareness. But uh, a theme that looks quite complex, and I've written it on the screen here, so global citizenship, we ideally would like our students to gain exposure to global cultures in order to foster tolerance, intercultural understanding, and a healthy respect for diversity. So this is pre-primary. We're talking here about four, five, six-year-olds. Is it at all possible, is it realistic, to cover what looks like quite a complex theme at this level? Well, I'd ask you then to reflect on it in terms of what do, you, what do students need to know? What can we do in terms of exploring attitudes? Is there any action they could do? And what skills would they need? So just have a think about this from a pre-primary level, please. So if we're looking at how we'd implement this theme at pre-primary, I would never be using words like tolerance, intercultural understanding, diversity. I wouldn't be using those probably in their first language, let alone in English. Instead, I'm just trying to get uh, a taste for what lies behind the theme, um, get, get our students to kind of taste and understand a, a little about what lies behind that theme. And really at this level, it would primarily be focusing on getting them to experience perhaps something that's unfamiliar. If possible, I might just bring in um, fruit that they haven't seen before, and if it was appropriate, getting them to taste it so they could see something uh, different in terms of food that they've never experienced before. I might uh, get them to just say, you know, what do you like? What fruit do you like? What fruit don't you like? Get them to hear their own opinions and also then the opinions of people uh, are in their class? What do their friends like and not like? And if possible, highlight the similarities that you, you like bananas and all the people here like bananas as well. Or, oh, you, but your friend likes grapes. Um, and we don't go, yuck, I hate grapes or I don't like grapes. We just listen respectfully that other people have different opinions. So what we'd be doing in the pre-primary classroom is trying to celebrate diversity of opinion, difference, without doing anything too complex. And the global part would be showing students that there is something beyond themselves. At pre-primary, they can be focusing very much just on me, 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 whereas we want them to be experiencing um, that there are not only people in your class, but there are people outside who have similar or possibly different opinions. And modeling and reinforcing considerate behavior. So all the things like you know, waiting, turn ta taking, waiting to give an answer, listening to other people without interrupting them. All those type of things, they may not seem like a global citizen, but they're actually important foundations for becoming a global citizen uh, later. So I wouldn't be put off by thinking you can't cover anything at this level. There are plenty of morals and values that link in well with global citizenship. Primary, of course, we can start uh, thinking perhaps a bit more complex. And the theme I've chosen here is discovering one's own bias. I've put a few pictures there. Um, in terms of bias, what might we want a primary age student to know about? What would we deal with in terms of attitude? And what kind of action could they be taking in a primary classroom to both discover and try to counter their bias? You'll notice I have a, um, a picture of a lady. You may be familiar with her, I'm not sure. Uh, she's a really famous footballer. She's a top uh, American footballer, but it's a, a woman footballer. It's Megan Rapinoe. How often in, in classes uh, when we talk about football and sport, do we perhaps focus too much on the men? Is it all about Ronaldinho and Ronaldo rather than uh, top women football players who've uh, excelled in their field? So it could be useful to give them a text um, 
that again, like the nurse and the firefighter, perhaps surprises them initially, but it shows them that there is diversity in the field of work. Uh, interestingly, her hair is kind of a pink color. We could perhaps introduce stereotypes to students. Is it true that all girls like pink and that all boys like football and all girls like ballet? Well, you could carry out a survey with the students. So you're practicing useful language. Do you like? Yes, I do. No, I don't. And from the survey of the class, if you have a mixed boy-girl class, you could use the results of the survey to determine whether that stereotype that all girls like pink is true. Or are there boys who don't like football? I guess I'd be one of those. So again, it's a simple activity. We often do it, asking questions, doing a survey, find somebody who, that type of activity. But we're slightly twisting it to focus on the issue of bias. And at the top, I've got some pictures here of uh, Aboriginal dream time and the Just So stories from Rudyard Kipling, um, giving students texts that expose them to creation stories, ideas about how the elephant got its nose or where the stars come from, according to different cultures. So you're opening up their minds that different cultures, different countries explain away different phenomena in the world to perhaps how we explain them. Uh, nice examples I've got again from Global Stage at two levels. We've got texts from around the world that explore just these kind of global citizenship issues. So what it is to be a friend. Uh, the one in the middle is looking, uh, learning from um, Native uh, Americans. Uh, it's an environmental story where the Native Americans respect their environment and they actually have better ideas for dealing with the environment than um, the, than the white Americans at this particular time in the 19th century. So nice texts. Again, we're not hitting students over the head with the theme, but we are doing reading skills, looking at vocabulary, uh, doing uh, comprehension questions, all with a flavor of what it is to be a global citizen. And then at the last level, again, secondary or above adult, perhaps a bit more complex, we can ex be exploring the concept of truth. Is there such a thing as truth? Um, pictures I've got here, we might look at issues like fair trade. Is it true that fair trade uh, is a good idea, that farmers get the, a better price? Uh, are there any flaws, problems in the system of fair trade? What about globalization represented by the tanker? Um, advantages, disadvantages. Is it true that globalization benefits everybody? Fast fashion, fashion. Uh, environmentally challenging? Um, do you buy lots of fashion? Do you throw away? What's the effect of that? And that little calculator, you could be looking at the carbon footprint, calculating it. So again, it's when you're preparing this type of uh, lesson, what do you want students to know about these truths, these issues? How are you going to explore what they think and what other people think? bringing in other audio materials, reading texts, and what can they do about it? They might just do a role play where they play the part of a farmer in a developing country and a consumer and a supermarket and they explore the issues of importing foreign food and the cost of it. You might be looking at uh, issues of privilege, discrimination, power imbalances. So we're kind of building, extending, and strengthening the concept of what it is to be a global citizen. And as I put here, lifelong learning, it's something that uh, we, we need, and I myself need, to learn about it all the time. It's not a, a fixed set curriculum where we can tick everything off and say, I've now completed my global citizenship. We're learning throughout our entire lives. Um, final part. Uh, bringing this all together, it can often be good to do a collaborative activity or a project. And this is from some secondary materials that Macmillan have produced. So it's a project where you look about a theme, an issue, in this case, an icon in your country who's made a positive difference to your community. Um, students collaborate to make this presentation. And the nice twist here is it could be then delivered to students in another country through a virtual classroom exchange. So you could set up a link with a school either in your country or in another country where students then online get to give their presentation, listen to each other and reflect on it. So it's kind of drawing together all the different threads of knowledge, uh, skills, actually then doing something, a presentation, presenting information from your country to others. So for me, it's global citizenship uh, education in action.
Okay, um, that I think brings me to the end of what I, I wanted to give in terms of input. So I'd like to now open it up for any questions and, and comments. Anyone at all? Jonathan, you can't see me, I guess. Jonathan? Hello. Hi, can you see me, hear me? I can, yep. Good stuff, that took about a minute for me to get through then, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Absolutely wonderful webinar. Thank you so much for putting it together. Um, you've got lots and lots of love coming through on this chat box here. Great. Uh, great webinar, it was amazing, inspiring. Thank you very much for putting it all together, Jonathan. Much appreciated. Pleasure. So we have got a couple of questions for you, if that's okay. Um, sure. I'm gonna try and collect them as we go, because this is usually the point where questions do sort of start flooding. So I'm gonna try and keep an eye on those and ask you at the same time. So um, first one is, is there any chance of getting a presentation of yours? Yes, we will send the present to you, presentation to you with the certificate that we send. Um, but a question for you, Jonathan. Uh, so Augustina has asked, is the concept of race uh, this is sort of, I think she asked this just after you showed the video of the classroom. Is the concept of race a bit old fashioned or no, or not longer used? Um, I'd say it's, it's a big concept nowadays. Whether it's appropriate in your teaching context is another question, but uh, really that video, yes, it was focusing on race, um, but it was primarily focusing on discrimination and discrimination can take many forms other than just race, of course, um, but it's certainly, if it's appropriate for your uh, age of learners, if it's appropriate for your teaching context, then it, it is something that could be um, considered. It's a controversial topic, and I know it's sensitive as well. Um, you know, in the UK, there's a whole issue about around statues, uh, appropriate statues, that type of thing. If I was with students in the UK who are watching it on television, this issue of whether you should have statues of people who are perceived as racist in the past. It might be a, a useful, interesting discussion to have with my students who are seeing this play out on their television screens. But equally, it might not be appropriate in another context. So I think the, the key point I'd bring here with global citizenship is that we're not saying you must talk about it, far from it. Talk about it if it's appropriate for your context, and if it's not, there are so many other issues to deal with perhaps deal with them first and come back to it, either with a later age group or at a later stage. Or if it's just not appropriate, then that's fine. Openness, honesty, transparency. If it's not appropriate, then global citizenship, just don't do it. Okay, cheers, Jonathan. Um, quite difficult questions to answer, I suppose, in, in these cases. It's sort of a, uh, an if and when basis and, and you know, where, where depends on pe where people are based. Um, okay, so we've got another question uh, from uh, Angelina. How can one address the conflict between nationalism and global citizenship? Okay, so again, this goes back to the idea of what uh, global means. Uh, as I said, it can refer to international, but it can refer to looking at your own community, uh, both family community, uh, school community, town community. Um, and it's not, I, I'm not sort of thinking of it in terms of uh, a confrontation, but just opening up students' ideas to uh, what attitudes and um, actions are taking place perhaps in a country setting, and if it's appropriate, comparing and contrasting that with what's happening in other countries or even other areas of your own country. So it's opening up that discussion, uh, opening up eyes, giving uh, different voices to different people. That might be one nation's voice, another nation, but the big danger here is stereotyping that this represents a nation, or this represents a group of people. We don't want to do that. That's the kind of thing we want to explore. And my very first slide about identity, you know, nations have different identities. Communities have different identities within that nation. So I'd be exploring those rather than setting up one in confrontation to another. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, okay, so there's, uh, if, if you could answer this quite quickly, John, this is a simple question. What is SEL? Uh, SEL? Social, emotional. Yeah, yeah. S 
Social emotional learning. Yeah. Do you, mind, do you mind just explaining the concept just briefly? A few people have asked that. Yeah, sorry, I was referring to, I think, to a webinar that Dave Spencer did recently. So it's looking here at um, the kind of soft skills that we uh, have in the classroom uh, that we need to be teaching and encouraging in our students. Those kind of soft skills of like resilience, determination, uh, collaborating with others, um, intercultural understanding. Those type of things are part of social emotional learning, ways to manage your own emotions, your own beliefs and show respect to other people as well. I think there is a great webinar on it, and it's available on the Macmillan website. Thanks, Martin. Um, so Francis has asked, um, would it be good? I mean, I think you've, 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 you've spoken about this, but maybe you can elaborate a bit. So um, they've asked, would it be good to maximize literary texts to introduce GCE? Definitely. Uh, and that's something in Global Stage, for example, there are some great texts there where, again, it's giving the flavor, the taste of what it is to be a global citizen. It's giving a role model mm. often through the literary text where you're then not only exploring the language and the reading skills, but you can also then see the theme coming through. And especially with younger learners, a story is always a really great way of getting over a, a message. Uh, and it can be an animal story, uh, fables, those types of things that have the, the message built into them. So, yeah, it's uh, something I would highly recommend at any level, but particularly the lower levels. OK, great. Um, so how so Toto has asked, how will you teach the theme of discrimination, um, which is quite sensitive to young learners, pre-K to K3 sort of age? So again, you have to decide whether that's appropriate for that level, and it might not be, in which case you deal with it at a slightly higher level. Uh, in terms of discrimination with, with that particularly young age group, um, I think I'd just be dealing with the idea that when you're asking and answering questions in class and somebody has a different opinion, that we learn to respect that opinion and listen to it. So I'm not, I wouldn't actively discriminate. I wouldn't do the Jane Elliott uh, experiment mm -hmm. with a very young age group but I'd be just yeah. building up behind that what she means. She means that we need to listen to everybody. We need to respect everybody. Everybody is valued. So I'd be just setting up that kind of theme in the classroom environment on a daily basis. OK. Um, Ellen has asked, how would you work uh, gender identity um, with secondary classes? Again, I mean, it can be a, a sensitive issue and it depends on the country that you're working in and the culture and the teaching context you're working in. I would deal with it as I would with any of the issues and you, the teacher, know whether this is appropriate or not, but I'd be giving a reading text. Uh, there are many texts in newspapers that deal with it or some kind of, um, you know, role play where you're looking at different types of people uh, who have expressed different kinds of identities. Um, there are some good websites out there, certainly in the UK, uh, that deal with these sensitive issues in an appropriate way for the age group. So I might be going to the those kind of professionals and taking uh, materials from there. Um, I think it's, it's good to get professional advice with the particularly sensitive topics. All right. Uh, and the last question, if that's all right, Jonathan. So uh, Katria, um, uh, so I'm going to start. So they've they've told you something first. I'm just going to let you know they've they've told you a little bit about what they what they do and how this would work for other levels. So I try to utilize similar themes in my English classes. We talked about the application in different age groups, uh, but I think English level is also very important. These themes really work with students after B1. What do you think about A1, A2? Um, again, it goes back to whether you only want to be dealing in English in your classroom with these issues or whether it might be appropriate some of the time to be using the, the first language. So global citizenship doesn't just mean teaching in English. It, as I said, it can be all subjects, so therefore all languages. So that might mm -hmm. be one area you want to approach that for a small part of your lesson, you might want to explore the issue in the first language. Uh, if not, I agree, the materials, you have to grade them. Uh, according to the, the language level of the student. And if it's too complex and it's not going to work, then I think you just have to leave it to a later stage. We can't cover everything about global citizenship at every level. It's lifelong learning. Ideally, it's built into the curriculum and it's uh, scaffolded and structured so that um, you can return to different topics at different levels in a more cognitively demanding way. 
Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I think uh, I think that's I think we're going to stop the questions there. So, once again, thank you very much for putting this presentation together. Absolutely fascinating. Really, really interesting. Love that video. I'm going to watch it myself tonight. So I think that's my evening viewing to watch that film. Um, and thank you, of course, to Federica. She's there in the background, making sure it all um, goes to plan. So thank you for all your continued support, Federica. Um, I hope you know by now, by the amount of thank yous that you've received from me and everyone else. Um, how essential and brilliant you are to all of these webinars. Thank you very much. And thank you to the wonderful teaching community out there. It's great to see you all again. Uh, I've missed you all since the festival. Um, you know, we, we, I think we had, we had a session with Dave Spencer a few weeks ago, but it's great to see you all again uh, in the same place. Um, so yes, thank you for coming. Uh, before you go, uh, I wanted to tell you a bit more about the course that Jonathan spoke to you about. Uh, yes, there will be other webinars, um, Esra. Uh, if you go to macmillanenglish.com, we've already got um, quite a few coming up. So go and have a look and register for those you'd like to take part in. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about Global Stage. Uh, so Jonathan flagged up a few things uh, in his talk about how it um, can aid in teaching global citizenship education uh, to younger learners. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it. So it's six levels. Um, it teaches language uh, and literacy for young learners. And it helps them to be competent, confident English speakers, as well as caring and responsible global citizens. Um, it's got a language book and a literacy book, two separate books, and they're designed to be worked together, worked with together. Uh, they cover the four skills and provide a solid foundation in vocab and grammar, uh, but they also support the development of things like uh, self-direction, thinking skills, SEL, social emotional learning, which uh, Jonathan just told you about, um, and of course, global citizenship. Uh, this year, we're very proud, very glad to announce that there's a new language workbook, uh, which gives you lots and lots of additional uh, opportunities for some heads down work uh, on grammar and vocabulary, um, and also gamified language and literacy activities uh, in the student's app. Um, the, digital the digital components of Global Stage, um, which have been recently configured, um, make sure that whatever your teaching situation is, wherever you are, whether you're teaching blended, completely online, a mix of everything, face-to-face -face, uh, entirely, um, then Global Stage has got the configuration that you're going to need to be able to do that. Um, so there's a link above my head, above mine and Jonathan's head, just there. It's red, Global Stage website. Uh, go and take a look.